All right, I'm going to erase what's up here, okay? We're gonna, we're gonna, we're running out of room. So, um, take your Bibles over to Ephesians. We're gonna shift gears a bit and talk more about, um, about some specifics about marriage. So, <clears throat> the four Gospels present four perspectives of Christ, right? Um, Christ the King, the Servant, the Son of Man, the Son of God. I believe that the books of Galatians um, uh, through Colossians um, present four perspectives of a believer, okay? So, they're, they're the... Um, uh, if, uh, Galatians is the outer man, how how we ought to respond to um, people and things outside. Um, Ephesians is the spiritual man. It's it's a book on really on spiritual conflict and how to deal with things in a spiritual uh, the spiritual realm. Philippians is the inner man, and then Colossians is the perfect man. It's what what we would look like if if we had were fully conformed to the image of Christ. And, um, and that's an important thing because that's our goal. Like that's, that's where we're headed, right? Um, and, and there's a lot there we'll, we'll kind of talk about here more in, in just a few minutes. But in the book of Ephesians, I'm going to give you a basic concept outline here real quick and then we're going to get into the text. But in the book of Ephesians, the, the focus of Ephesians is all toward chapter number 6. Um, finally, my brethren, put on the armor of God, right? That's the focus. The whole book is leading to that point. Just like in Philippians, the whole book is leading to think on these things. Uh, but, but he lays the groundwork for all that to build to this, this point, right, this goal. Um, so in chapter number 6... Um, we, we're putting, you know, put on the armor of God is not possible if you don't lay the foundation um, in the beginning. So the first three chapters of Ephesians um, are dealing with our position in Christ, our identity in Christ, and our and our uh, purpose in Christ. Which, um, when we understand our position, identity, and purpose, then we have boldness and confidence. That ends chapter number three, and then chapter number four is about bringing our practice in alignment with our position, okay? So doing the things that a person who is a believer would do, right? Um, uh, in other words, um, doing these things don't make us, doesn't make us a believer, but because we're a believer, we ought to do them. And, and you know, this aligns <coughs> who we are with what we do. And then um, in chapter number four also, he begins to lay out the the this um, area of access, if you will. So um, if you think about the spiritual realm or you as a, as a building like this, for instance, uh, Galatians is about outside this building and, and Philippians is about the, the interior filtration system of this building and Ephesians is about the security of the building and identification of the building. And so um, on your sign out here, um, home of Victory Baptist Church. It's identified, right? But then also it's secured. And so there's the doors and the windows that are locked and you have the security alarm. And, and if someone was to come along and leave one of the, leave the alarm off or leave a door open, it provides access for a ne'er-do-well. It's uh, a great term. I like that term. Um, to, to enter and do harm, right? And so what chapter four, five, and the first part of chapter six are it, it's um, it's kind of like all the doors and windows that we might leave open. There's a little more than 50 of them mentioned in those four in those couple chapters of of access points. Um, things like lying and stealing and and anger and so forth that are all in chapter number four. Um, in chapter number five, he he goes through a lot of attitudes and and even um, uh, the work works of darkness and and so forth. Um, involvement with with uh, worldly and or demonic things even. And, and um, then he, he talks about, even in chapter number five here, he, he talks about just not walking in the Spirit. And 
Um, he says in verse number 18, um, you know, be filled, be not drunk with wine where it's excess, but be filled with the Spirit. And, and then he, he goes in and gives um, some, some um, evidences of being filled with the Spirit. In verse number 19, he says, singing to yourselves in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. So the, the person who's filled with the Spirit, as it talks about in verse number 18, will have a, a joyful attitude. And then in verse number 20, a thankful attitude. And then in verse number um, Verse number 21, um, a humble attitude, submitting yourselves one to another in fear of the Lord. And verse number 21 is not connected in a direct connection to um, verse number 22 in the sense of, um, I've heard people say that, well, the Bible says in verse 21, we're supposed to all submit to one another. So it's not just about a woman submitting to her husband. Well, that's a, mis, a misapplication of the text. And I'm not sub- saying that um, a, a man shouldn't be submissive. I think that most men create problems in their home because of their own lack of submission to the authorities God's put in their life. And so if you're not going to submit to your boss and your pastor and the government and all that, and in your home you go, you spend your time bad-mouthing all of your authorities, then don't be surprised when no one wants to follow your authority because you're not the, the sum total of all authority. So anyway, there's that. So... It's interesting that he talks about being filled with the Spirit before he starts talking about marriage. Because he's getting ready to illustrate the fact that marriage is a spiritual union. And it needs to function in a spiritual way. And yet also he talks, he's, he's giving still this open door and, and how... We often create or give access to Satan to create problems in our life because our marriages aren't right. And as a matter of fact, he says that over in in 1 Peter, that if if a husband isn't responding right in his home, his prayers will be hindered in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 7. So spiritually, he's going to have conflicts and problems because he's not right and he hasn't closed the access to Satan to cause trauma in his home. And that access can be given through the husband and or the wife, both, And so he deals with that here. Now, I want to draw our attention then into verse number 22 and and the situation here that that we have um, concerning uh, this, this process and or the securing, if you will, of the home. And he says in verse number 22, Wives, Submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. And please understand the context here in verse number 22 is very consistent with the theme of the scriptures that um, authority is ordained of God. Romans chapter number 13 very clearly tells us that God, all authority comes from God. And Paul says you ought to submit to every ordinance of man. And and he tells them that they need to submit to the authority of the government, specifically a government that was about to kill him. So he believed and practiced what he taught. And he says, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as unto the Lord. In other words, don't submit to him because he's right. Submit to him because you're submitting to God. Um, Okay, so this is a popular opinion I have. But it's based on the Bible, so I say it anyway. Um, That that, um, submission doesn't mean anything until you disagree. Until then, it's just agreement. Say, I submit to my pastor, you know, and so what have you ever disagreed with him about? Well, nothing. Then you've never submitted to him. Ever. I submit to my husband. Well, when, what do you disagree about? Do you submit there? Because that's really where submission matters, right? Um, it doesn't matter if you're in agreement. It's easy to submit to someone you agree with. You're not actually submitting. You're just joining. Submission only takes place when there is disagreement. And you sub your opinion and or will to that of those in authority. You put it under, right? Um, it's, It's an interesting thing to look at in the scriptures because, you know, forgiveness, we talked about a minute ago, um, Forgiveness requires offense. God told you, God commanded you to forgive. And yet, how are you going to practice that until you get offended? And yet, when we get offended, we say, God, how could you let this happen to me? He's giving you an opportunity to do what you've been commanded to do. The Bible commands you to show mercy. 
How are you going to show mercy if there's never someone that does wrong? You must be offended. And the Bible specifically says that offenses must come. You cannot tell if you're walking with God and growing spiritually as a believer until you face offenses and conflicts. That is the only way to know. And when you talk about submission in regard to the marriage, it's a similar thing, ladies. It's not about your husband being the the almighty, powerful, right person. He's not always right. Sometimes he's a flat-out idiot. And any honest man would amen that. But you're not submitting because he's always right. You submit because even when he's wrong, God can protect you. You know God can protect you and judge your husband at the same time? We'll talk more about that here in just a little bit. But um, Brother Hayes used to tell Angela and I when we started counseling um, this is the, the thing that struck, we struggle with. One of us would be um, all right and having a good day, and the other one would be in the flesh. And when I'm, you know, I mean, like angry and frustrated and, you know, bad, uh, you know, negative content, you know, tone and all that type of stuff, right? And, and then, the, then, you know, for instance, if I came home and I was having a pretty good day and she had been at home with all four of our children, I don't know why she kept having bad days, but... <clears throat> then I would come home and and um she would use those those words like she would she would be huffy and upset and I'd say what's wrong and then the two most dreaded words for a husband here nothing well, I mean it seems like something's wrong nothing's wrong I'm yeah you heard it too I know I'm fine no, no, you are not fine. And then I, being the brilliant person I am, would be like, oh, you want to be in the flesh? I'll show you being in the flesh. I can be more in the flesh than you can. Come on. Never been there probably, but. So you don't both have to be wrong. Hello. Hello. You don't both have to be wrong, but we do. Why? Because, well, we don't want to submit to the Lord. That's really the issue. Now, enough of beating up on the wives here. Let's look at verse 25. We'll talk more about the wives later, but verse 25. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with washing of water by the word. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So I want to stop there for just a second, and we're going to talk about two big, very big, big important things. All right. First of all, the purpose of authority. A wife is to submit to her husband who has been given that role of of authority in the home and it's important to understand the roles of authority so um you've got a husband here i don't know if i i don't think i told you yesterday but these are actual hieroglyphics i i that's true i was in um in egypt i went to the national museum and we'll we'll just make this lady very nice nice lady here and um I was in the National Museum, and this is exactly what the hieroglyphics look like on the actual, am I right? It is. So these, this is very, very, very uh, um, accurate. Um, so this is our husband. This is the wife. And, um, and the husband is a picture of Christ. And the wife, I, I know the church is not a building, but... But uh, the wife is a picture of the, the church, right? That, that's what it says. All right. Um, as a matter of fact, it, it says, you know, husbands, uh, you know, the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. So it gives that very, very distinct connotation here. Now, let's think about that for just a second. <clears throat> the Bible says that, that we love him... Because, why? 
Okay, he first loved us. So the Bible says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. And there's a reciprocation that takes place in this. We, we love him because he first loved us, so there's a reciprocation that takes place. Uh, the, the manifestation of that is what he was talking about in the beginning. So he says in, in the end, in verse 33, he says, um, even so, husbands, love your wives. And wives see that they reverence their husbands. And, and reverence is the manifestation of love that a man understands. So man, men and women understand love differently. Um, and, and we don't see things the same. Um, women, women perceive love in a different way than men do. And men perceive love as a matter of respect and admiration, okay? Um, and that's what they desire. That's the, the two things that combine to form reverence, respect and admiration. And it's interesting, the Bible says that someday we're going to come before the throne to admire Him. Why? Because that's love, right? And we're to have fear the Lord. What is that? It's respect. And respect and admiration are how... God perceives love, right? Uh, and it's how a man perceives love. And men would rather be respected than loved every day of the week. That's how men conceive of, of love and, and why men would say, man, I love my, my, my friends. I love my, my brothers, right? Um, but there's, how do they demonstrate it? They don't go all touchy-feely, holding hands and, you know, uh, well, if they do, then it's a different thing completely. It's not, not that at all. But but what do they, they show each other respect, okay? And they admire, man, I can't, you did a great job on that, you know? And that's how men conceive of love. Men conceive of relationships shoulder to shoulder. Accomplishment equals relationship. Um, and for women, it's not that way at all. Women conceive of face to face for, for development of relationship. Men don't have to talk to have a relationship. Two men can get together and they can go out hunting. They can sit side by side in a blind for hours and say nothing other than, can you pass me that coffee? <laughs> and they go home and they're like, wife would say, well, how was it? It was awesome. Man, he is such a good friend. And she says, well, what did he say? Nothing. That's what made him such a good friend, actually, is that he didn't say anything but what we did together we accomplished we killed something we skinned it right we did something and that's what builds relationships so i'm saying this on purpose ladies your husband wants you to come help him work on the car and you don't know how to work on the car and you feel like all i'm doing is standing here handing him a dumb wrench and I have important things I could be doing instead of standing here doing nothing because he's not even talking to me. And what he's trying to do is build a relationship with you in a way he understands relationships. You need to build that relationship. Yeah, you need to go out when he's working on stuff and just hand him nails. True. And then step back and say, wow, you are an amazing carpenter. It almost stands up straight, <laughs> right? It's unbelievable. You're just like Chip Gaines. Yeah. I hey, I, I don't this. I don't know why in the world, but Angela and I were flying somewhere, and this lady says to me, she goes, "Wow, you look like Chip Gaines," and I did not know who that was. Okay, because I had not watched any of those shows. And, um, and I said, I don't know who he is, but he must be an amazing looking man. And she goes, he is. And I was like, whoa. And Angela was with me. I was like, no, this is my wife here. We're not. Anyway, so, but um, yeah, just amazing, amazing job you're doing, honey. Just like when we talk about, we come together and what do we talk about? Man, God is so good. He is so amazing. He does everything well, Right? We praise Him. We lift Him up. That's, that's what we do. That's how we express our love for Him. How did He express His love for us? He died on the cross. And He hears us. And He listens to us. Every time we go to Him, 
we can go and pour our heart out to Him and tell Him all our troubles and all of our problems. And He always hears us. And, and He never says He doesn't have time for us. Never. He is always there, no matter when it is, in the middle of the night, in the darkest point in our life, He is always there to comfort us and to minister to us and to love us. That's this relationship. It's a perfect spiritual relationship. That's the relationship that a husband and wife are to emulate. You are not to emulate your pastor and his wife's relationship. You're to emulate Christ and the church. Okay? And so we demonstrate this in how we emulate here, right? I'm, I'm to be like Christ, and she is to be like a church. Now watch this. This is really intriguing. When we don't, when we don't, when we allow a separation or a conflict, then what happens generally is this, that the husband, instead of loving the wife like he ought to, begins to love himself more than he ought to. And he just does what pleases him. He becomes a hunting addict and a golfing addict, you know, and or whatever else it is. And he just focuses on his pleasure and he's not there for his wife. And the wife is different. She takes those little kiddos and she focuses her attention on the kids. She says, well, I'll show, I'll show him. I'll pour all my love and affection and admiration into the children not into him. <clears throat> and so this is the problem here. Well, first of all, they're miserable in their marriage, but they're staying together for the kids. But then what happens is this, that the kids get a wrong view from dad and from mom. And the wrong view affects their view of who Christ is and the church is. And so they begin to think, God doesn't care about me. God doesn't love me. God only cares about himself. God doesn't, doesn't you know, care about my problems and my needs. And so why should I care about him? And they begin to think, I want a church that focuses on me instead of on God. And you say, well, why are there so many touchy-feely, you know, churches out there. This is exactly why. Because people want a church that resembles their home. It's where they feel comfortable. And so if home was all about me, then church should be all about me. And so they're pursuing that and don't even realize that what they're doing is they're perpetuating a wrong perspective of who God is. Now, most people don't think about it in this fashion, but the reality is, is most of us have a view of God that is a direct correlation to how we view our Father. A direct correlation. And view of the church, which is a direct correlation of how we view mom. That's a bad situation, because often what our perspective of our parents are reflective of their flaws, not their, not their strengths. And so when we think about God, we think, well, God's uncaring, God's unloving. God, you know, and we know, we know mentally who God says He is, but we don't feel or connect with God in that fashion. We don't feel that way about Him, right? And so it creates all kinds of, of uh, mis, misunderstandings about our relationship with God and affects our relationship with God dramatically, dramatically. Um. And so we'll get up and we'll preach and say, um, we'll say, you know, I've heard people say this, and I, and I probably said this at some point in time before I understood a little more than this, but um, we'll say, you know, if you don't have any desire to read your Bible, if you don't have any desire to pray, if you don't have any desire to go to church, you might not even be saved. And, and we say, whoa, and I don't really have a desire. I mean, I know I ought to, but I don't have a desire to. Maybe I do sometimes, and I, but I just don't feel like it. And so maybe I'm not saved. And then we have all these doubts and we create doubts in that scenario. And, and, um, and, and our doubts are based upon our desire instead of, a, instead of the clear word of God. But then this is a reality. This is a huge reality um, that uh, I, had a, I had a guy come in 
uh, for counseling one time. He was, he was in our church in, in the past, in the past. And um, he was constantly coming for doubts about his salvation. And I just couldn't seem to get him to accept it. That, well, the Bible says, I mean, it's clear what the Bible says and, and uh, so forth. And finally, one day I was studying on this particular thing. And I, and I said to him, I said, um, tell me about your dad. He was an older guy. I didn't know his, his family. I said, tell me about your dad. And he turned red faced and he said, my dad was a no good idiot jerk and I hated him and I want nothing. I never had anything to do with him. I'm glad he's dead. And I thought, okay, this might be a problem. So I said, well, let, we talked about that for a while. I said, let's meet again uh, a few days from now. So we met again a few days and I said, um, how often do you think about God as being kind? He said, never. And I started just going through attributes of God. How often do you think about God as being loving, compassionate, protector, all those type of things? Never, 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 never. And I pointed out to him, this is the same things he felt about his dad. And he had transposed all this, all this wrong things from his earthly father to God. And no wonder he didn't want to be close to God. Why would you want to be close to someone who's not kind and not compassionate and not protecting you? And why would you want to be close? He didn't want to be close to him. So he really didn't want to be close to him. Even though he acknowledged and understood he was a sinner and needed forgiveness and believed Christ died to pay for his sin and had accepted Christ as his Savior, he didn't comprehend God as his Father in a biblical sense. He perceived God in relationship to his own earthly father and transposed those negatives upon God. And we do that too often. And so in the marriage, in the home, this illustration holds very soundly. And I I say it like this, please, please parents accept and understand this, that even though your parents were not good examples or may not have been good examples, even if you had a very bad example of a mom and a bad example of a father, You are without excuse because they are not to be your examples for how to have your marriage. You have a perfect example. But what you have to do is stop looking here and excusing yourself. Here's what we do. We make make exemptions. This is what I did so often with my expectations of my wife is that I would say, well, I expect when I get home, my wife is going to be happy I'm home, and she's going to be thankful I was out working all day, and she's going to be so excited to see me, and she's going to run up and give me a big old kiss, and uh, she's going to say, come on, honey, I prepared dinner already. Sit down and eat your favorite meal and, and give me a foot massage and all that kind of stuff, right? Expectations. And the kids are going to be so obedient They're going to be so glad to see me. They're all going to bring me pictures. They drew me instead of cleaning their room, you know, all that good stuff. It's going to be wonderful. And I get home and the kids are all fighting. My wife is stressed out and she's snippy. And and then I'm and then what happened is this. Because of my expectation, I gave myself an exemption. I don't have to be like Christ because no one here is like Christ. I don't have to be a good husband because my wife's not being a good wife. I don't have to be a good father because my kids aren't being good children. And I exempt myself from my responsibilities. And we do the same thing with our parents too often. Well, I don't have to be a good husband. I'm just a better husband than my dad was. And that becomes, he becomes the standard. And so we compare ourselves to him. But Paul says, that we compare ourselves among ourselves, we are not wise. He's not the standard. Your dad is not the standard. Your mom was not the standard. Christ is the standard. This is the standard. And so the problem is, is we compare ourselves to the wrong standard, but then also we fail to recognize that those that come after us are, are going to follow the model we set as well. And so my deficiencies are going to be magnified. Isn't it strange the things that we despise most about our parents are very often the same things that we perpetuate upon our children? That's true. Come on, the things that you look at your kids and you go, man, that really annoys me. Think about that for just a minute. It's probably 
annoying you because it's just like you. And so we perpetuate that. So we see this model, but then we also see in our text, we see this, this purpose of authority. And this is something very, very important that we need to grab hold of is that why, did, why is Christ the head and why does he make the husband the head? And this is a, such a significant truth because we often misunderstand authority. We think of authority, and Jesus even said that this is how Gentiles think about authority, that they think about authority as a means in which to exercise our lordship over others, our, our power, our position, and we can you know, dominate and rule. And Jesus said that's exactly how Gentiles tend to think about authority. Um, but it's also how the Jews thought about authority. The Jews, um, the, the, the Jewish leadership thought about authority, and they looked at their authority, and they said, our authority we're going to use to condemn and judge and criticize and kill. That's how the Pharisees used their authority, right? And they had some authority to do that with. But Jesus had all authority, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. He had all authority. What did Jesus do with his authority? He healed, he loved, he served, he fed, he gave, he taught. What is the purpose of authority? Men, you need to grab this. This is so transformative if you'll really grab a hold of this. The purpose of your authority is just like Christ's. His authority is used to make us glorious. That's the purpose of your authority in the home. It's not for you to be in charge. God, didn't care. God doesn't just love men so much He wanted them to be in charge. No, He wants a man to be like Him, just like He gave Himself to make us glorious. He wants you to give yourself to make your wife glorious. Number one problem men have is selfishness. Self-focus, that he might present it to himself a glorious church. My job as a husband is to make that lady sitting right there the most glorious person she can become. That's my job. Now, our home is not about her, it's about Christ. But my job as her husband is to help her become the greatest person she can possibly be. That's my job. What's her job? to show reverence and submit to my leadership. Now, can I tell you this is a really, really simple thing to understand. If she knows that my purpose is making her glorious, this can be really easy for her to submit to my leadership, even when she doesn't agree with my direction. Hard to submit to someone who has selfish motivations. But glorious. So how did he do that? How does he present us to himself a glorious church? Now this is, we're working backwards here philosophically, right? So how does he do that? Well, that's interesting because he says in, in verse 26 that he might sanctify. That word means to set apart for oneself. And then cleanse, that means to purify, to make clean and pure. And then he says with the washing of the water, by what? Okay, what's the word? Nope. I thought the same thing. It's not your Bible. Wait a minute. It says the word. This is the word. Yeah, except for that word is logos. Right? This. This is the logos, the written word. But word here is not logos. It's rema. Rema is the spoken word. I mean, that matters. It's not capitalized, it's not Christ, and it's not the Bible, it's communication. Um, what sanctifies us and cleanses us is when we come to God and we pour our hearts out to Him in prayer, and He hears us, and He forgives us, and He comforts us, and we're pouring out, we're cleansing we're feeling close to Him. Isn't it an awesome thing when you come and you just spend time drawing into the presence of God 
and communicating your heart to Him, and you just feel it. I mean, you feel His presence. You know His presence. You say, man, uh, this is a special place. How did it happen? Because you went and communicated with Him. It's communication that makes closeness in this fashion for us. Now, when you were dating your spouse, you listened to everything they said, or at least they thought you did. Right? They were like, no one understands me like he does. Right? And he just listens to me, and he knows my inner thoughts, and he knows everything about me, and he didn't, but he pretended anyway. Right? But it's what makes a lady feel close to a guy. By, by the way, um, adultery for men is not about sex. It's about respect and admiration. Um, they pursue someone admiring and respecting them. They don't feel like they're receiving that. And adultery for a woman is not about sex either. It's about feeling known. It's about feeling like someone gets them and understands them. And so they'll have an affair with someone who just listens to them. It's interesting because the Bible term that's most used when it talks about marital relation is the word new. New. And when, when a, the Bible says this, and, and Peter will look at this here after a while, but it says, it says um, that we're to dwell with them according to, it's interesting, isn't it? Knowledge. Know her. How do I know her? I communicate. And the more that she feels I know her, and understand her, because that's a deep-seated need that she has, to feel like she's not alone, and that someone understands her, and knows what she's going through, and knows the burdens she's carrying. Doesn't want me to fix them all, she just wants me to know them. And the more she feels understood, the more open she is to being known. Does that make sense? The more she feels known emotionally and intellectually, the more open she is to feeling, to being known physically. Okay? But men should never view this as a means to this. This is my job as a husband to show her my love, to know her. The other is the fruit of, the culmination of me loving her like I ought to love her. Okay? And so I pursue knowing her and dwelling with her according to knowledge. Now, how I do that is through the Word, through communication. So how do I communicate? How do I properly communicate? Well, I'm going to, let's hit this, and then I think that this will be all that we can get to this morning. But go over to Matthew chapter number 6, because if we're going to, I said this at the beginning, if you're going to fix a problem in the physical realm, you have to look at the spiritual and work your way backward, right? And so the spiritual connection to Verbal communication is prayer. And so let's examine prayer here in light of the idea of communication and see what principles we might be able to apply back to our communication. All right, so Matthew chapter number 6. So let's start in verse number 5 because it says, When thou prayest, so this is the beginning of this discussion. All right, so when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to stand, pray, stand, pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Now let me give you a couple principles of prayer, and then as we get into the model prayer here in just a moment, some just some thoughts, okay? First of all, um, if you need to communicate about something important, don't do it in public. That is not... Not the place to communicate about important things. By the way, a lot of times it's the death of communication. And sometimes we think, well, I need to say this publicly, so if they get mad, then they'll, they'll control their temper. You will, con you will destroy your ability to communicate if you do it publicly. Period. Don't, don't do it standing in the synagogue in the corner of the streets. If it's something important, you need to set it aside as important and do it properly. Okay. 
Then verse number 6, When thou prayest, enter into thy closet. When thou hast shut the door, say and pray unto thy Father which is in secret. And thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. I notice this statement, he says, enter into thy closet. There needs to be a designated place for important discussion. Um, if you have a serious issue you need to talk about, don't do it in a place that will defile that place if it doesn't go really well. Laying in bed at night is not the place to have arguments. The bed should be undefiled. It is undefiled. So you, should, you should have discussions about serious things in a different place. Okay. Verse number 7, when, thou pray, when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they th- think they shall be heard for their much speaking. <clears throat> Leave off clamor. Quit bringing up the past. Deal with the current issue and not every issue that you've ever had. Can't solve every issue in this conversation. You can only deal with one. So deal with this one. Okay? Don't, be vain, don't use vain repetition. Things that, and by the way, most of the time, vain repetition begins when we think we're losing the argument. Okay. Verse 8. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need before ye ask him. Now let me stop for a second and say this. Um, God knows everything, but your spouse doesn't. Your Father knows what you need before you ask. Your spouse has no idea what you need unless you communicate it. I'm speaking here primarily to ladies because... Ladies have this insane idea that men can understand hints, <laughs> and they cannot. They are just not capable, all right? They don't get it. Um, Angela and I, when we first got married, she, I got her, our very first Christmas together. She loves this story. Um, I, our very first Christmas together, um, I got her this gift. I thought it was awesome. She opened it up, and I could just see as soon as she opened it, her disappointment at best, all right, just, he was like, oh, and I said, you don't like it? Oh, no, it's, it's great, it's fine, fine is the worst word in the world, it's fine, it's fine, so, but I didn't, I thought you'd like it, she goes, well, you know, I, I told you what I wanted, I said, you did? Yeah, I told you five times, I don't, I don't remember, what was it you said? She goes, well, the first time, we got that, that um, flyer from uh, the jewelry store, and I put it on the table on top of the bills, face up. I'm like, yeah. Hello? What more did you need? Like, you didn't tell me? <laughs> well, I also did this, and I said, okay, but, but did you tell me? She goes, well, I did this. And quite literally, this was the, the culmination of the story is, she said, okay, fine, I didn't actually say it. I just thought you would understand from all my hints. And I'm like, well, obviously that didn't work. Let's stop that process. Like, I'm too stupid to get your hints. They're just too smart for me, you know. So you're going to have to just tell me stuff. And by the way, she gets what she wants now. She tells me. Say, but it's not the same. Well, do you want what you want or do you want a cause? Huh? Now, after 29 years of marriage, I know what she wants now. Jewelry. That's it. Jewelry. Gold and silver. Tokens of my affection. (laughs) Offerings. Anyway. All right. Moving on before I get in trouble. More trouble. (laughs) Your spouse does not know what you need or want unless you tell them. God knows your heart. They do not. Okay. If they somehow manage to accidentally get you the deepest desire of your heart, it was an accident. Trust me, it was an accident. Complete accident. So don't count on that ever happening again. Lightning strikes once, right? Verse number 9. So here is the model prayer. After this manner, therefore, pray ye. Okay, so here he starts. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Now, the first step to communication is praise. 
And I think it's important that you understand the necessity of a climate or a culture of praise. Okay? In other words, if the only time you praise your spouse is when you have something negative you want to talk to them about, they're going to catch on. And then it won't mean anything. You understand? It needs to be constant. We ought to constantly be praising God. We ought to constantly be lifting Him up, not just when we need stuff. So you need to build a climate of praise in the home where praise is normal. Praise is, is continual. Thank you is a constant word in your home. Great job. I love you. You did a wonderful thing there. You, you're a great cook. You're a, you're a great uh, mechanic, honey. You can take that car to the mechanic like nobody else. <laughs> right? You always remember to have the oil changed. Tires rotated. I never have to worry about breaking down because I know that you're watching. There's some praise in that, right? All right. Um, honey, you're a much better cook than my mother ever was. Very important to say. Amen. The other will get you killed. So praise. It's consistent, constant in the home. All right. After our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Then the second thing, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Um, this is assistance. Now, um, from a biblical perspective of prayer, he is not saying, dear God, I hope someone does what you want them to today. He's saying, Lord, let me do your will here like you would have it done there. Say, me, I submit myself to you. I'm willing to do your will. That needs to be present in your home constantly too. Um, honey, is there anything I can do to help you? What can, okay, I'm going to get all you guys in trouble right now. Your honey-do list ought to be done. Well, if I do it, she'll just add stuff to it. Yep, yep. And you know what she'll also know? When she talks to all the other ladies, man, my man is good. Yeah. He does. Man, I told him I needed these things. See, the dumb, here's the dumb thing. Guys are like, she never tells me what she wants. She wanted you to pick your socks up and put that window shade back up. Well, I mean, you know, like, I meant like gift-wise. Well, yeah, that's really going to show her you love her. You won't pick your socks up and put the window shade up, but you're going to get a magic gift that fixes everything. That's like your kids when you say, go clean your room. And they come back 35 minutes later with a picture. Is your room done? No, I was drawing you this picture. I didn't want your picture. Isn't that a frustrating point as a parent? Like, tear your picture up. I don't want your picture. Clean your room. How can you show me you love me? By cleaning your room, right? By putting up the blind and picking up your socks. I know, that's weird, right? Well, thy will be done. Then he says third. Now, these two things have to be consistent, constant, for the rest of this to work, okay? Give us this day our daily bread. Now, this is asking for assistance. Ask for help, okay? Um, here's a really important thing. When we are having a problem, we have a tendency to blame the other person instead of identifying the actual issue. It's easier for me just to say, Angela's the problem, than for me to identify and quantify what the real problem is and how it can be solved. And that creates a constant source of conflict and accusation which destroys the relationship. So we have to identify what is the real problem that we need help with. All right, I'm going to give you a, an illustration from our own um, horrible experience. Um, we fought a lot about how I was a slob, all right? I 
I put my clothes on the floor. This is the worst offense a man can ever commit, putting his clothes on the floor instead of in the hamper. Well, maybe the second worst. And it was constantly a fight in our home. But there were two things that kept me doing it. This is honest truth. All right, number one, my dresser was beside my bed and my closet was beside my bed. So it made sense for my clothes to be beside my bed in a pile. Okay? Because that's where I changed. All right? And number two, it made her mad. So I kept doing it. I know that that sounds ridiculous to say out loud, but it's actually true because. I didn't want her to have the satisfaction of me admitting I was a slob when I had a significant, serious justification for what I was doing. But we never actually discussed it. We just called each other names about it. So here's my pile of clothes. Here's our conflict. We start going to counseling. We start getting counseling. And we start learning about how to communicate properly and I came home one day, and we'd learned about these first things here, praise and, and uh, assistance, offering assistance. And so um, I came home, and, and I walk in, and my wife says, Hey, honey, I'm so glad to see you. I'm so thankful for the hard work you did today to provide for our family. And I'm like, yeah, I did. <laughs> she said, Is there anything I can do to help you? I know you have class tonight. I was taking Bible counseling, counseling classes at the time. She says, Is there anything I can do to help you? Get ready for class. I know you got a lot on your plate. No, I think I'm pretty good right now. And I remembered, all right, I'm supposed to also offer to help her, right? So I said, so is there anything I can do to help you? And she said, well, there's one thing. I'm like, okay, no problem. I got this. I'm going to help her. And she did something different than she'd ever done before. She said, she didn't say, pick up your clothes and put them in the hamper, you slob, which is typically what the conversation had gone like, okay. Um, she said, I'm having trouble getting all of my chores done through the day. And so it makes me run late on having dinner prepared when you get home before you go to school. And I, I said, okay, well, how can I help with that? She said, well, one of the things that I struggle the most with is when I go to do laundry, because the kids' clothes are scattered in their room, in the bathroom, down the hall. They just throw clothes anywhere. And then I have to go sort through their clothes and find their clothes. And I'm like, we will fix that right now. You get them in here, I'll whoop every one of them and tell them exactly how they ought to be doing it. And then she said, and then your clothes are over there and mine are over here. And I said, okay, all right, no, I get it. Because it made sense to me. For the first time, quite frankly, it made sense to me that this was a problem for her that was impacting her ability to do things that would help me. For real. I hadn't understood that before. And so I said, here's the thing with the clothes. The, the dresser's here. The closet's here. I change right here. The laundry is there. But the hamper's over there two rooms away. And that doesn't make sense to me. I don't understand how that, that makes it better, even though the clothes are over there. How does that make it better? Is there any way we could make this work better for us together instead of just putting the hamper over there? And here's the, the beautiful thing that happened. She said, okay, here's why I put the hamper over there, because it's just a laundry basket. It's kind of ugly. I don't like it in the room. And if I had something that was nicer that would kind of go with the decor... I wouldn't mind having it in the room. So guess what we did? We went shopping. We found this beautiful little laundry basket. We put it in the room, this hamper, and it fit the decor. And it wasn't a struggle because it was moving where I was putting my clothes from here, literally like six feet over. Guess what? We were both really happy. Truly, we were happy because she wasn't yelling at me about my clothes, but my clothes were always in the hamper. Now we can both just yell at the kids. <laughs> that works, right? We're united. <laughs> and so then when we built a house uh, a few years later, guess what I did? I thought the entire house revolved around the laundry system. This is true. Like, 
the, the house uh, had the, the center of the, of the house was the laundry room and our bedroom and our bathroom and our closet. And our closet was adjacent to the laundry room. And I built a chute that went between the two. So I had my dresser and my clothes and I just put all my dirty clothes in the laundry and I just pushed it and it was right in the laundry room. I am like the best husband ever. I mean, I'm just saying that because she, she won't say that. So I had to say that. She does. But asking for help requires this. It requires you to actually quantify what the real problem is. The problem is not them. What is the problem? The problem for us was not that I was a slob. The problem was we had different perspectives, and I didn't understand that this was hindering her from doing her job. As soon as I understood that, and it brought a quantifying to it, I was willing to help. But when you're willing to help, also listen, even you're the one that needs help, don't be adamant that it has to be done your way. Be open to solving the problem and working together to solve the problem instead of just having your way. The reason we continue to fight often is because we're not willing to resolve the problem. We just want the issue. We're more like the Congress No problems get fixed, but we always have campaign ads, right? So that's a problem and why we continue to perpetuate them. So ask for help. Give us this day our daily bread. Here's what I need. Then verse number 12, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And so we have to ask for forgiveness and extend forgiveness. All right? And then the last, uh, the next thing here, um, he says, "Deliver us not into temptation, but uh, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil." And I put here, plan. How can we make sure we don't have this problem in the future? Let's stop having the same argument we've been having since we got married. Let's deal with it, forgive one another, and plan for the future so we move forward instead of revolve in the same revolving door. And then finally, he says, For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen, right? And so we go back to the first thing. Right? This is a climate in the home. This is a solution to our problems. The Bible tells us how we can get answers for our problems through the Lord. This is the process, right? Prayer. Prayer moves God and God moves the world. Communication works the same way in the home. And so we have to begin communicating properly if we're going to have this. Now, here's the thing. How does God make us glorious? Watch the tie-in. Sanctifies and cleanses us through the washing of water by the Word. And our home becomes glorious. My wife becomes glorious. She's happy. She's joyful. We have a wonderful relationship, and we truly do. We have a wonderful relationship. Say, so you never disagree? I didn't say that. We disagree because we're normal. You know what we don't do anymore? We don't fight. We honestly don't. I, I don't remember the last time we fought. I remember the last time we disagreed. You know what we did? We sat down and discussed what each of us needed in the situation, and how we could solve a plan to resolve the problem. We forgave each other if there was any misunderstanding, and we resumed our process. It works. I'm just telling you, it works if you'll use it, because it's God's plan, and God's plan always works, right? If you understand your role, you understand the purpose that God has put there, and you use His process... Then, then it will repair damage in your relationship. Now, after lunch, we're going to hit one other passage and, and really drive this home a little bit stronger. But um, we're going to stop there, Pastor. I'll turn it back over to you. All right. I think we've got um, all the stuff over there next door, that sandwiches and fruit and different things over next door. 
uh, and desserts. And so um, feel free to go over next door, eat with us. If you have to leave, you can go, but we'd love for you to stay for that last session. So we'll eat together, spend the, this a little while uh, eating, and then we'll gather by, back up and come back over here. It's all uh, over the other building, drinks, tea, drinks, stuff like that over there. So uh, we'll pray here for the food, and we'll be dismissed. We'll come back in here maybe 45 minutes or so from now. We'll come back in. Let's pray together. Lord, we love you. <clears throat> Thank you for this time we're able to spend. And it's been very, very profitable, very, very, very helpful. Thank you for your word, uh, and thank you for what it does in our life. I pray you'd help us to leave this place being obedient to your word and applying it to our lives. Bless our food we're about to eat and our fellowship now in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd say this. Let me say this. Um, let them eat. And um, so don't go to them and say, all right, now start answering this question, this question, this question, and they never get a chance to eat. Let them eat, and, um, and then we'll save all that for afterwards, okay? Yeah, they can go out and eat as well.